I'm so excited to bring you to the main event now. So Chris Elmore is an alumni of UNC Charlotte and helped start Avid Exchange, a business unicorn and the ninth largest fintech company in the country with over 1,200 employees and growing. Named a maverick and a mold breaker by South Park Magazine, Chris has written eight books, two of which he tells me he really actually likes, and countless articles with tons of spelling errors, and he travels the country speaking on topics of startup success, innovation, entrepreneurship, sales, technology, blockchain, and automation. He is also professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at UNC Charlotte and at Queen's University, and he's the entrepreneur in residence for the Charlotte Chamber of Commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, here to speak to us on our global theme of chaos, please welcome Charlotte's own bearded wonder, the rock and roll unicorn daddy. Come on up! Woo! Caught in a mosh. Yes. They, they ask. Oh, okay. All right. There we go. That's enough of that. Someone could get hurt. Yeah, I used to. I used to. I was in the pit when I had long hair uh, in my twenties, but now I stay out of it because I hurt myself significantly. How's everyone doing? Yes, yes, gosh, this is great. Now that I look out and see all of these nice, wonderful faces, I really think I should have written something down. Thank you. These are the jokes. They don't get any better. So let's get started. Here's the thing about chaos that, as I was kind of discerning this talk and figuring out what I should talk about, and one of the great things about chaos is, you know, we're subject to it, right? We have chaotic episodes. We have chaotic moments. We have chaotic lives, right? I mean, we, chaos can be around us. Um, but the other thing that I thought was interesting about chaos is um, we produce it, too. And so not only are we subject to it, but we produce it in our lives and in other lives. So it's kind of got that double-edged sword to it. So I'm hoping more than anything that today I'm going to run you through a couple of stories of my life and by the way, every time, okay, hang on. Does anyone get uncomfortable around emotional men? If you do, we're going to ask you to leave now. Because every stinking time I practiced this, I cried. So, yeah, oh, poor guy, yeah. My wife's here, and she's already getting emotional, which is making me emotional. It's a peristaltic chain reaction. That's uh, from Saturday Night Live. All right. It's going pretty well so far. <laughs> Thank you. So here's the thing, is that um, my hope is that as creative people, is if we let chaos rule in our life, it has a tendency to shut down our creativeness. So I hope more than anything, you'll get one or two things away from this that you can kind of use to maybe keep chaos at bay a little bit. And then hopefully I can tell the story without getting too emotional. Now, uh, my man Brandon up here, who's live streaming this right now to his network of at least 67 people, um, he said, he goes, don't worry, man. If you suck, no one's going to tell you. So thank you, Brandon. I appreciate that. <laughs> He's my bar setter. <laughs> so um, here we go. So let's, uh, let's get to know each other. Let's see if I can actually work this slide thing. Oh, look at that. We're going to get to know each other. This was the car that took me to first grade that is simulated woodside paneling. This is, I grew up in Boone, North Carolina, where we put our major appliances on our front porch because we are proud of them. <laughs> Boone in the house? Yes, Boone in the house. This is the way we got our entertainment in Boone in the house. This was my first video game. It, who, who knows it? Yes, I know, I know. And, and, and people are going to go home and go, oh, it was awesome. He had Pong. Damn it. Okay, uh, one thing. By the way, um, a lot of you don't know this because uh, Tim and Matt forgot to say it, but uh, Creative Mornings has a podcast that's fantastic. Yes, download that podcast because on the podcast, I'm going to talk about how Pong today creates more pink eye than anything in the world. So if you want to know how Pong creates pink eye, you'll listen to the podcast, okay? All right. Now, this was the upgrade to that video game. I got this in the Atari 2600, and when I got this, I said, it does not get any better. Right, sir? You, you know what I mean? Yeah, this was it. And then this was my first computer. Now, for some reason, uh, Ada, can you come in here and bring me my phone? Quickly, hustle. I only got five minutes. Bring, this is my son, Ed. Yeah, hey, look at that, Ed. Do it, take a bow. <laughs> he did not take a bow. 
Uh, my wife said that my third child, Ed, is most likely, most like me. And we were at dinner, and, and she made an announcement to my kids. And she said, uh, kids, uh, whatever you do, don't repeat what dad says in public. <laughs> and then he looks at Ed and goes, especially you. <laughs> All right. So this was my first computer in 1980, and this is my computer today. Now, there's a big difference between these two computers. I'm going to move on here and look at that wonderful beard. But the... You know, this computer has, what, maybe two, 3,000 times the ability, maybe 5,000 times the uh, usefulness than that other computer. And so, but has, has anyone ever noticed that technology has a tendency to kind of create chaos in our life? Have you noticed that? And, and have you noticed another thing about technology is that not only does it create chaos, but it also, have you ever noticed that it's speeding up? These, these chaotic moments about technology are getting more and more and more. Well, that's what I do. Uh, you're welcome. So um, I consider myself a, a disruptive tech entrepreneur. Um, you know, Avid Exchange in the house, right? Where are we, Avid Xers? Yeah. So at Avid Exchange, what we do is we automate the accounting process, which, by the way, if you want to clear the room of people, all you have to tell them is, I'm in accounts payable. Who wants to talk? And yes, on an airplane, what do you do? Well, I automate the accounting process. The guy's going, oh, my God, we're all the way to L.A. on this thing. So, but, you know, there's something about disruptive technology that I'm not, you know, it, it creates a ton of chaos. And, and, and a little bit about the company across the street. We have 1,100 Avid Xers, five locations. We're known as a business unicorn. You know you're three times more likely to make an NFL roster than you are to create a business unicorn. But that's not the story I want to tell you. I want to tell you a little bit about how we got started and weave in a little chaotic moments. But we started in 2000 with this idea. We took it to New York City. We did this big pitch. And the only thing they said was about our name, and they said, I guess all the good names have been taken. That was our first pitch. Yes, let that sit. My parents were proud. I didn't tell them. I didn't have the heart to. So we took our, we took our idea, and we tried to sell it to the marketplace, and the marketplace said, no thanks. And we, had, we changed our idea, tried to do it again, and they said, no thanks. But what's that? Third time is what? Yeah, it was a failure, too. Disaster. <laughs> Complete disaster. It was an utter failure. So here we are. But here's the thing that I want to say is that as an entrepreneur, as a creative person, the more you struggle and you don't give up, I think that's a big thing. The more you struggle and you don't give up, what it does, it has a tendency to help you create really basic goals. And we had three. So in 2002, our first goal was to create a piece of software that people would buy. Now, a lot of people miss that. Thank you. The second one is that we wanted it at a high price because we felt like that could help us put value in the marketplace. If we charged and people were willing to pay for it, then we said we have high value. But the third one was we wanted a piece of software that people would use and it would be critical to their business. And our goal, Mike Prager, our CEO, this is his idea, he said, we want a piece of software that people use every single day. And so we got a little bit of advice, and the fourth one was that product. And we grew just a little, just a little, just a little. And then all of a sudden, nine years into it, we were sitting, sitting on a decent amount of money. So here, are you ready, creative people? You ready for what we did next? Is here we are. We're sitting on a decent amount of money. And what we did is we took everything off of that product that was paying the bills, and we put it onto a product that was unknown with kind of a crazy value proposition, no customers, and hadn't been built yet. What do you think? Thank you, ma'am. There's a lot of ways of explaining, you know, that situation. Stupid comes to mind, ridiculous, chaotic. But maybe this, this is the first thing that I want to say about chaos is that when, when you're in a situation like that and you lean on your skills, if you have great skills and experience, it has a tendency to uh, mitigate chaos. So it never felt like it was risky. I always tell people that entrepreneurs aren't risk takers. But what entrepreneurs are great at is they're great at managing uncertainty. You know, there's so much uncertainty and chaos, so much uncertainty. And really, if you think about it, dealing with uncertainty, leaning on your skills, you know, being confident of your skills is a real asset when it comes to keeping chaos at bay. So that was one thing that we did. And here's kind of the story that when we took the money off the one that was paying our bills and put it on the unknown one, um, 
it just went through the roof. It was like, boom. We went from 40 people to 1,000 people within just a short period of time. And this thing started producing, just started producing, producing, and producing. We caught the attention nationally of, of Bain Capital. And Bain Capital said, we'd like to invest $225 million into this great idea. And we said, cool. <laughs> then uh, two banks came along and said, we want to invest $22 million. And we said, cool. And then MasterCard came along and said, we want to invest $300 million. And we said, no thanks. I know. My wife gasped. She was like, oh, you should have taken my... No, but then they talked us into it, and we said, cool. But <laughs> there's this backstory to that. But here's, here's what happened. Hey, by the way, not bad for a... Um, it's my wife. Not bad for a company where all the good names were taken, Right. So we had all of this wonderful infusion of cash, but the th that's the setup to the story that I really want to tell you, and this is when I start to get weepy. And that is one of the crazy things, if you're like me and you go after your goals and dreams, I know that sounds a little trite, but if, if I'm an obsessive goal setter, and if you're like me, one of the things about setting goals, and I hope this hits someone in the right way, one of the things about setting goals and achieving them is you always realize they were set too low. If you think about that, because the thing is, you know, I want to go after this. 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 And it's that process that you go through. So basically, all of my business goals have been realized with all of this funding and all of these great people that are really running the company now, and I'm taking credit for it. All of these, all of these uh, business goals have been realized. And I had a real moment where I wanted to... I wanted to go after a bigger goal, something that was way more important than, you know, maybe a 200,000 square foot building in, in the music factory. And what I, what I landed on and what I want to give to you today is that I really wanted to go after what does it mean to be successful? And I felt like that, because here's the thing, is that there's a lot of people out there that pursue success, they pursue happiness, and they never really have a, a, a definition for it. And so what I thought was, you can't go after anything that you can't quantify. So if you don't have a definition for something, it's really hard to know that you've achieved it or you're there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I wanted to go after what it meant to be successful. So what I ultimately landed on, and I want to give this to you, and I hope more than anything, by the way, at the Chris Elmore, it's the Chris Elmore because there's a lot of imposters around, right? Mary Alicia, we had a conversation about that, and they're posing on behalf of me, and so I'm shutting them down. But would, uh, would love to connect with anybody, any social media, would love to connect with anybody on, you know, whether you agree or disagree. Well, just the ones that agree. Um, about what I'm about ready to say. So I want to connect on this. But I found, what I found out is that my success was tied directly to the quality of relationships that I had with other people. And so when I realized that, now first of all, there's my wife. She's, she's hot. <laughs> I tell people, ready, have it, extras, you guys know what's next, right? I, I tell people that if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. And then as we, uh, as people get older, as people get older, they start looking similar. So one day I'm going to be hot, smoking hot. She won't have a beard. That joke was better without the beard. No, you wouldn't look good with the beard. But uh, fortunately, my wife and I, we had a great relationship. So this next, this next section is called gratuitous applause because two weeks ago we celebrated. Shut up. I know, 25 years. I'm not going to get through this in a row. <laughs> so our relationship was good, but the thing was, once I got on this thing that I realized that success and quality relationships were attached, I got real fired up about it because... That made me proactive about what success is. And it also, it also let me leave all of that financial stuff behind, you know. We, uh, the second year of Avid, I got my car repoed, and it was a Nissan Altima, and there's no more affordable car in the world. When the guy came and picked it up, he was like, oh, my God, what's wrong? <laughs> 
You know, it was bad. And then when I got cocky, I, I bought a Porsche, and my son here blew the engine out of it. <laughs> so that worked out real well. Good job, Chris. Way to go, Kyle. So um, anyway, sitting in my garage, looks great. <laughs> anyway, but then what I started realizing is that I can improve some relationships outside of that. In the relationships with my coworkers and with my family or, or with my extended family. And then I, I got real excited about it because I wanted to um, extend it way out. So I just started going to random people, you know, like people that in restaurants that you see all the time that wait on you, you know, or maybe your dry cleaner or the people who clean up, I got my man that's cleaning up around here. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. So uh, shout out. So, um, and then the security staff at our building. And I met this guy named Steven. And so, you know, it wasn't like we were chums or anything like that. But I'm like, Steven, how you doing? You know, I've been walking around today. No one's been mugged. It's great. You're doing your job. You know, good job, man. Good job. You know, just a little bit of kindness is what I wanted to give to him. And then what happened was that... Um, you know, I've known him for a little while. Uh, I went to have, uh, I just ate lunch at Chipotle, so I was feeling a little bloated. <laughs> it happens. It happens. We're all human. So I was leaving Chipotle, you know, and um, I come around the corner, and I, uh, Stephen, his eyes catch mine, and his eyes immediately go to the ground like this. And something was obviously wrong with him. But I was like, man, everything going okay? And he wouldn't tell me. He was really, really kind of racked with this huge chaotic moment in his life. And so what happened was um, literally weeks went by before Stephen told me that he was in a relationship with someone. The relationship ended badly. And he, his words were, she did some horrible things. And I'm really having a hard time getting over it. And now, folks, I'm glad that wisdom kicked in because I said this to Stephen. I said, you know what? You know how in these situations, sometimes you don't know what to do and you give some advice. Well, one door closes, every door, another door opens, every cloud's got a silver lining. I decided not to go that route. I said, look, Stephen, it's probably going to be tough, but it's your fight. But I got to tell you something. I'm in your corner. Just a little bit of kindness is what I was. All, th that was the only thing that I felt like Stephen needed at the moment. And time went by, time went by. Every time I'd see him, I'd go, hey, man, I'm in your corner. I'm in your corner. I hope everything's going well. And then all of a sudden, Stephen does something remarkable. What he does is he picks himself up, he dusts himself off, and he reinvents himself. And what he does is he goes back to school, he becomes a, a full-fledged police officer, and he gets a job at then Carolina's Medical Center as a full-fledged police officer. And I couldn't, I couldn't have been more excited for this guy. And then I remember my buddy's here, Chris, he's here somewhere. We were going to lunch, and we came back from lunch, and it was Stephen's last day. And I, I told Chris, I said, I have never seen anyone lower than this guy pick himself up, dust himself off, and reinvent himself. And I looked at Stephen, and I said, man, I said, Stephen, I am proud of you. And you know what, folks? He was proud of himself. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, that's a, it was just a wonderful moment because he knew that he had done something great. He did it on his own, and I was proud of him, and then I never saw him again. So, yeah. But, you know, it was just one of those things, and he was there, and that, then he was gone. Now, a couple years later, it's going to seem kind of random, but a couple years later, um, my mom, okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, when he talks about his mom. But my mom was diagnosed with cancer the second time, and it was the, you know, I, I didn't, I, and my, my kids are here, so hopefully... I, hopefully my kids one day, maybe their kids will say, I can't believe we put that stuff, you guys put that stuff in your body to kill cancer. I know it's all we got, and it works great, and everyone's doing the best they can. But, you know, when it's, when it's aggressive, the treatment is equally as aggressive, and that's what she was going through. And so it was the day of surgery, so she had to have a double mastectomy. It was a day of surgery. And I can't tell you... <laughs> all the chaos that was going on in my life at that time because I didn't, there was unknown outcomes 
And it was just heavy, you know what I mean? Just heavy. To the point where when I walked into that hospital, I completely, even though I could function, I just couldn't think. You know what I mean? The chaos had chaos had a hold of me that much. I just couldn't think. And and well, let me give you an example of how difficult it was for me because um, I walk up to the counter and the only thing that I could think was, I'm here to see my mom. And that's what I told the guy at the front. I go, I'm here to see my mom. And he was actually kind of a jerk. He was going, I need a little more. You know, I'm like, okay, hang on, I'll get it. But that's when I heard, um, all right, hang on. So that's when I heard behind me somebody say, he said, he said, oh, my God, it's you. Why did you guys get so quiet? And I turn around, and it's Stephen. And he he starts he he starts thanking me for everything that I had done for him. Now I couldn't remember what it was. It was one of the what are you talking about? You know you you were the, you know that kind of thing. But this is the point that I want to make. When chaos has a hold of your life, you go back to the hike, the quality of relationships that we have with people. And if you buy into that at all, the most miraculous thing was all that chaos that was swirling in my life, the second that I turned around and I made eye contact with Stephen, it completely went away. It, and it didn't come back. It was completely gone. And you know what? The thing I love about that moment was years previous, years previous, I showed a little kindness to somebody that just needed it. To that time, when I walk into that hospital, he just showed me a little bit of kindness. I just love that. Don't you? I just love that. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to put chaos at bay, I'm going to finish with this. Uh, what am I supposed to say? Gucci? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. But I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to say, you know what? Hey, hey, Charlotte, let's, let's, let's just be good to each other. Is that cool? Is it? Yes. Do that. Do that. Because, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer up a challenge. And like I said, let's connect on this. I'll offer up a challenge. If there's somebody today that needs just a little bit of kindness, hopefully this story has illustrated how a little bit of kindness can go a, a huge way. If there's somebody right here today or when you see today that needs a little bit of kindness, let's do it. Are you cool with that? If there, yes. <laughs> I feel, like I'm, I feel like I'm starting a revolution rally in the square. We're going to listen to Duran Duran songs and wear scarves. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, Chris Elmore, everybody. Chris Elmore. Elmore at the Fillmore. That's really generous. Oh, a cup. We bes bestow, courtesy of Queen City Growlers, the official Creative Morning Charlotte coffee mug is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, please. Chris Elmore, everybody, thank you so much. Next month, please meet us at Savona Mill on the west side. Our theme is going to be Honesty on October 5th, and it will be featuring dual, dueling talks by Paige Failing and Jason Harper. Thank you for being here. Embrace the chaos and be nice to each other. Woo!